extra credit coming your way. Um, so, uh, what, so what I wanted to do today was just uh, give a sense of my book that is forthcoming from Cambridge University Press in uh, expected 2023, um, China in 20th and 21st century African literature. This is a little different than what was circulated, I think, um, in your in the network. I think that was a, uh, an article on Congo Inc. Global South novel, and then also on on Bandung and and Global Southness. So these this the book is related. Um, none of the real materials overlapping, um, which is interesting in and of itself. So maybe there's a, a point of comparison um, that we can draw out in the conversation afterwards, but. Um, thank you, Shilio and uh, Stephanie and everyone else who's invited me to uh, the Goldsmith Racialized Postgraduate Network. Um, and I'm happy to be part of the Counter Canon Lecture Series. So I'm just going to give you a sense starting off here of where the re research came from and some of the questions uh, I was trying to answer uh, throughout the book. And then I'll go back and uh, read a little bit from my introduction, just the chapter breakdowns, key concepts, these sorts of things. So hopefully not more than 40, 45 minutes here, um, if that's okay. Um, so uh, this book is coming out in a new series from Cambridge University Press called Cambridge Studies in World Literature and Culture. Um, and it's an interdisciplinary book. Uh, a lot of it's literary criticism and theory, post-colonial studies, African studies, Asian studies, cultural studies. Um, and as I'll talk about in, my, in, the, in, the, in the presentation today, um, I was explicitly trying to do an interdisciplinary approach um, and, and kind of moving in between different types of methods. So um, let's see here. So this is the motivation for and some of the key features of the book. Um, one of the most important motivations for writing a book was the need to understand uh, new patterns of globalization exemplified by exchanges between Africans and Chinese. So we've got, you know, a new phase of multipolar globalization. Of course, these things aren't um, just economic phenomena. They're not just investment or trade. They're also cultural, linguistic. Um, and so what I was really interested in is, 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 is weighing in on the relationship between culture and globalization within an Africa and China context. Uh, I look primarily on uh, Sub-Saharan African um, cultural production. Um, so there's lots to do about the Trans-Saharan stuff as well as um, Northern Africa. Uh, but I focused on, on, on uh, South and Central. Um, the second motivation for uh, writing the book was the need to provide a more nuanced understanding of Africa-China relations as not being actively instrumentalized by jingoistic politics. Um, if you casually Google Africa-China relations, you'll find all sorts of sensational media headlines that are more often than not um, you know, part of some sort of nationalist discourse vis-a-vis -vis geopolitics. Um, which can really reduce the dynamic to this very uh, bare bones hero and villain story, which is really not um, how, doesn't really reflect the nuance and complexity of, of, the, uh, of the dynamic, not only in terms of thinking about it as uh, a contemporary phenomenon, but also something that's actually very historical. And then the third motivation was uh, the need to think systematically about the cultural and symbolic ramifications of these exchanges uh, instead of thinking of them as only political or economic phenomena. Um, so this is where the book's main inter intervention is. I'm taking uh, literature as my primary object of inquiry, um, but I'm very much interested in drawing out the symbolic dimensions. Um, and these symbolic dimensions, as I'll talk about in the different chapters, um, the first aspect or theme that you could think about is, is uh, geopolitics going all the way back to third worldism and the Cold War. Um, second chapters on extractive industries. So the symbolic dimensions of, 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 of Chinese natural resource extraction in various African countries. Uh, third chapters on diaspora. So moving more into cultural identity, um, a lot on Stuart Hall's uh, theorization in that chapter. And then the fourth chapter, which is probably the most appropriate for uh, the a racialized postgraduate network is a, a chapter on race and racialization. So um, that's kind of the, the motivation for the book. 
Uh, some of the key features is that are that um, it's the first book blank study of cultural symbolic dimensions. There have been a smattering of, uh, of articles, but this is the first one that really tackles um, the cultural representation question systematically. Um, it's also interdisciplinary um, and it's a way to avoid the presentism of the contemporary dynamic. I think I've mentioned some of this. And then it's also, I do work between Anglophone and Francophone um, at cultural expressions. So um, sometimes this comparison can get kind of linguistically siloed. Um, so I do have Anglophone and Francophone texts um, that I'm looking at. Um, and some, and both of those, some of the texts that I read actually have a lot of um, you know, indigenous African languages, for example, Swahili um, in one particular text that I look at. Um, so the, the, the hook for the book is that it challenges assumptions by privileging African creative voices and the polemics over whether China is colonizing Africa. And the book is designed for students and scholars who want to know more about the cultural issues that emerge from globalization between Africa and China um, and the different related themes such as Cold War, decolonization, geopolitics, resource extraction, diaspora, gender, and race. So um, after that kind of uh, introduction to the book, I'm gonna read a bit from the actual introduction. Um, and uh, you know, if, if somebody has a question, you know, feel free to stop me. Uh, I may move around a little bit. I try not to, um, yeah, read, read too, too much here, but um, just to get into it. Is China's future African just as Africa's future is Chinese? While this question may seem contentious, even absurd to some, the reality of the early 21st century suggests otherwise. I take up this contention by examining representations of the People's Republic of China, the PRC in Sub-Saharan African literature from the end of the Cold War and into the 2000s. The scope encompasses how China, which emerged as a main engine of the world economy by the end of the 20th century, transformed patterns of globalization across the continent. Uh, this era of multipolar globalization means that the West no longer holds a monopoly over the paths to so-called development. The comparison also reveals the alternative history of exchange between Africa and Asia as far back as the 15th century, capturing the symbolic points of reference for China's current investment in Africa. Uh, to contextualize these symbolic relations, this introduction lays out the gap in Africa-China scholarship regarding the humanities and um, world literature particularly. The need for humanistic scholarship on Africa-China relations pinpoints how these exchanges are more than just economic or political. They're also linguistic and cultural. I also articulate how the book intervenes into African literary history. I detail my method of interpreting these texts according to frameworks that include the Cold War, Third Worldism, the Indian Ocean, the Global South. Um, these approaches enable how I read African literature beyond its conventional relationship with the former European colonizer and really the West in general. One main goal is to rework our understanding of post-colonial literature's worldliness by configuring it according to African literary imaginaries of China. So my argument is post-colonialism accretes new textures, historical, racial, linguistic, cultural, and theoretical, when read against the backdrop of Africa-China relations. I examine how literature imagines and interrogates how Cold War revolutionary idealism became a full-fledged economic pragmatism. I map how the discourse of anti-imperialism and Afro-Asian solidarity manifests as declarations of non-interventionism and mutual economic benefit, which accompany virtually every joint venture between the PRC and an African nation. By tracing this discourse through how it manifests in and is subverted by trope, I provide a nuanced examination of how China functions symbolically in Sub-Saharan Anglophone and Francophone literature over the long durée of the 20th century and into the 21st. Okay, um, so I go into a literature review, articulating the gap, um, basically saying that no one's really talked about it extensively from a humanistic standpoint, although this is becoming more, more and more prevalent. Um, and by focusing on um, literature, I move uh, the scholarship away from uh, not only social science and economic um, studies, but also from a, a pervasive uh, Sinocentrism. So, so when people talk about the Africa-China dynamic, it's almost always about 
conceptualizing China as the actor and 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 um, you know different African states as as having um, less agency in the dynamic. And this is something I wanted to uh, decenter and shift away from privileging African creative voices, African agency conceptualizations of this dynamic. Um, and so the literary analysis provides quite simply the creative language uh, through which to conceptualize a new uh, era in geopolitics and cultural exchange. Um, let's see here. So one of my headings, African literature elsewhere. In this section, um, well, I'll read the first paragraph here. Although my in initial intervention is to provide a book length humanistic approach to scholarship on Africa China relations, I make an additional intervention split into three parts within the field of African literature. The overall intervention manifests in reading Sub Saharan Anglophone and Francophone African literature beyond how it imagines the former colonizer, Western neo colonialism, or Euro, Euro America. Instead, I enact a 180 degree turn towards East Asia regarding its interpretive direction. This turn away from the West is a primary object of scholarly, as a primary object of scholarly inquiry, opens up a host of fresh comparisons, which not only provide new ways in which to understand the worlding of African literature, but also um, to do the real work of decolonization by moving beyond the limitations of reading post-colonial identity only in opposition to the Western nation. And that's a paraphrase of uh, Edward Gleason, so a quote from the Poetics of Relation. So in this section, I, I do a bit of another lit review in terms of the three approaches, thinking about it in terms of Cold War um, paradigms and, and talking about uh, mono, recent monographs um, in and around African literature and post-colonialism by Rasen Jagalov, uh, Bhakti Shrungarpur, Monica Popescu, Jenny Watson, and Peter Kalini. Um, the main thing here is, quote from Popescu, to reveal the watermark left by the Iron Curtain in fiction, essays, and memoirs penned by intellectuals from the former colonies. Um, so this is really important for me uh, in terms of thinking about uh, or examining Maoism as a symbol in African literature, um, and also to demonstrate how these Cold War histories continue to inform how China circulates discursively in the contemporary moment. Uh, the second uh, methodological uh, intervention is um, coming from Indian Ocean Studies. Um, and I pull a lot from Isabel Hoffmeyer here. Uh, she writes that, quote, um, the Indian Ocean as method obliges us to extend our axes of investigation to pursue productive post-national and post-area studies uh, that feature lateral transnationalisms within a previous third world space or within the global south. Okay, so she says, quote, this complicates any simple binaries introducing this idea of the global south, um, which is my third uh, intervention, uh, global south studies, which is kind of this emergent field, trying to think about um, exchanges and dynamics and mobilities between uh, non-Western uh, regions and, and places. Um, so I, I, my point of departure here is kind of a, a precursor to full-blown global south studies. Uh, by uh, Francois Leon, Francois, Francois Lyonnais and uh, Shumei Shi, their uh, minor transnationalisms, which came out all the way back in 2005, looking at quote horizontal interactions. Um, and I also pull a bit from Dilip Menon um, when I'm thinking about the global south here as an attempt to think quote uh, as an attempt to think societies and polities and uh, in their own terms and from their own from their concepts. And it pushes back against how concepts from quote concept from Asia and Africa are seen as mired in particularism. Uh, the fact that the idea of universals is merely a self-regarding European nativism, end quote. Um, I also pull from uh, scholars like uh, Rus Russell West Pavlov and then kind of capitulate a bit of uh, uh, other Global South scholarship by Sherman Slaughter on the Atlantic South Atlantic Charter. Amiya uh, Tisuera on um, thinking about the dictator novel as a critical genre of the global south and also other work that I've actually written on, on the Afro-Asian Writers Bureau and Lotus and, and those sorts of um, publications. So one of, the, one of the, uh, the questions that I anticipate when you talk about uh, China as a you know, part of the global south is that um, to call China a member of the global south in the early 2020s is probably fraught at best. Uh, but the PRC nevertheless remains a critical catalyst for the emergence of the global south as a viable label. 
For better or for worse, China's rise disrupted the Western-centric geopolitical hierarchy, dominating the world order since the high period of European imperialism. It is not so far-fetched to claim that the Global South partly emerged as a term to grapple with how the PRC is currently reshuffling the world order, especially in regions that designate themselves as post-colonial. African literature then provides an arresting set of analysis to understand the symbolic dimensions of this Global South shift. Um, so the next section, talk about history and symbol in Africa-China relations. Um, let's see here. So each chapter um, considers the Africa-China dynamic in a unique way and is so organized in sections focusing on one text at a time. I prov provide clear points of access for readers who may be interested in a particular author, narrative, or nation. My analysis thus moves across many countries on the continent. Uh, by putting the chapters in discrete sections, I historicize each text according to its nation's past and present engagement with the PRC or more capaciously China. Uh, this approach crystallizes the very literary question of from where and to whom are these texts speaking? Uh, the intended effect of historicizing my readings is to evince the symbolic ramifications of China in each national context so that historians, social scientists, and even political economists might bring the cultural dimension act affective weight to bear on how they examine relevant topics. Uh, so my, my method here um, is pulled from a Frederick Jameson article uh, way back when published in 1984, where he, he, he theorizes this thing called the quote, concept of history. Um, so instead of simply listing chronologically the events comprising the content in Africa-China relations, my analysis moves back and forth between events as they allegedly happen. They're often politicized interpretations and then through my close readings, um, there's symbolic slash uh, philosophical dimensions in literature. I capture how seemingly disparate events in different places were connected both materially and conceptually and demonstrate how cultural phenomena are not only informed, but also inform, uh, not only informed by, but also inform the circumstances of the event itself. So my method is chiastic. What I mean is history catalyzes art just as art catalyzes history. Um, a particular use for my method is how Jameson describes uh, the quote, shadowy but central presence of Maoism to the global 60s. So this book examines the symbol of Maoism in African literature, but this quote, symbolic Maoism is hardly the only symbolic dimension of Africa-China relations. Um, and some of these other uh, symbolic dimensions include the Cold War, Pan-Africanism, resource extraction, the diasporic journey, journey and racial ambiguity. So enough about method. Um, the other main thing that I was grappling with was how to conceptualize this dynamic. So since I'm approaching it from a symbolic cultural lens, what was this key concept that was going to help me understand these texts? So the alluvial um, as is emerged as a, a really, uh, really useful and operative word for understanding the different dynamic and how it changes uh, according to these different themes. Um, so this one, use several terms, but this one bears the most conceptual weight. Um, and so I'll just give you my brief definition that's in the intro. I define the alluvial as a fractal process wherein the textures and sediment of lived experiences accrete and erode through how individuals interact with, react to, and diffract the self-consciousness of others and the ever-shifting communities within which they reside. These communities, which are products of overlapping exchanges over space and time, churn out the deposits of cultural identity, the fertile silt that cultural actors sift through to articulate meaning. So throughout this book, um, the alluvial functions in term as motif, trope, form, and concept. It's particularly useful to emphasize the quote, planetary dimensions of resource extraction in Africa-China relations by connecting them to the positioning of cultural identities. And the, uh, the, the main kind of the bedrock for the concept of alluvial is again taken from Glissant. Um, in many ways, this book is about thinking Glissant through and his theories through Africa-China relations. So at different points, um, I'll be talking about creolization, relation, 
um, all the all the good stuff from Edward Gleason. So he's my primary theoretical point of departure. Okay, so um, just a quick uh, chapter breakdown, so you get a sense of of you know I kind of gave you a sense of the overall framework, but here's how each of the chapters are are are, are broken down. Um, the first chapter is titled Kofia Warner Imagines China and the Long Durée of Ghana PRC Relations. Um, so this maps a cultural history. I begin with the Afro-Asian solidarity of the Cold War and end with the beginning of the period governed by the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation or FOCAC, FOCAC. Its first summit occurred at the uh, turn of the millennium in 2000. In this chapter, I focus on the life writings of uh, Kofi Wuner, a uh, Ghanaian poet and diplomat, um, and how he imagines the history of modern China through a series of key geopolitical events in three poems. Um, the three poems are The Black Eagle Wakes, which was published in 1965, um, The Red Bright Book of History in 1989, and his translation of a Chinese phrase uh, uh, about an official trip to a rapidly industrializing China during the 1990s. Um, so what my argument is in this chapter is that Awuner brings the Awe tradition of the Hino Cantor, a cultural figure who sings the funeral dirge and the halo or a song of abuse to sift through what I call the alluvium of history, which is used in Awuner's complex imaginings of China. The speaker or the poet Hino exemplifies an alluvial figure that stands at the shifting boundary of land and water, the shore, to animate the chiastic relationship between art and history. Throughout the chapter, I introduce key concepts, Afro-Asian solidarity, third worldism, revolutionary teleology, disillusionment, and neoliberalism in the post-colony. I also explore the contradictory symbol of Maoism, um, which for many African writers, especially during the Cold War, uh, simultaneously means both guerrilla revolution and autocratic dictatorship. A winner's writings defamiliarize the universalist underpinnings of Western development discourse, bringing into focus the alternative historical trajectory of modern China and its implications for not only Ghana, but also the African continent. So this first chapter establishes this long durée, goes back into the Cold War and the shifting complex ways in which a winner uh, imagines China, what China represents in terms of development discourse, in terms of uh, revolution and Marxism, and then now this uh, post-Cold War period and, and post-Cold War development. So it just really gives a sense of, uh, or, or decenters the, the, the presentism of, of Africa-China uh, analysis and scholarship, as well as um, really and this maybe goes back to a bit of what you were talking about, Stephanie, at the beginning with the different types of racializations, but really privileges an Awe uh, epistemology or an Awe worldview, which is one of the uh, ethnicities in uh, Togo and, and Ghana. Um, and so really kind of shifting what sorts of knowledge or references are being used to understand uh, this dynamic. So privileging an African an A-way worldview to think about it. Um, chapter two, figures of extraction, representations of mining in Ghana and Zambia. And so this, this chapter is uh, the one that talks about, oh, is it a new colonialism? Right? So this is the buzzword. And this is the chapter that really goes in and, and, and looks at how um, that discourse of colonialism gets uh, mobilized, especially in how it relates to post-colonial masculinity and how post-colonial masculinity is reconfigured in Africa-China relations. I home in on what I call figures of extraction um, by examining representation, representations of mining, so literal mineral alluvium. So the first chapters about the alluvium of history, about this poet Cantor, Hino, that's standing at the shore between, you know, it's a liminal space between um, the water and land and this chiastic relationship between art and history. Alluvium in chapter two is like straight up mineral alluvium. So like gold, uh, alluvial gold in Ghana, uh, copper in Zambia. So, and I'm looking at two pieces of uh, genre fiction or popular fiction. 
Uh, so one main stake, stake here is to unpack the sensationalist discourse around Africa-China relations that depicts the dynamic as a Manichaean struggle between African hero and Chinese villain. Uh, another stake, another goal is to show how Chinese investment triggers the colonial trauma of European colonialism, even as the Chinese presence is configured in critically different ways. Um, I demonstrate that when the dynamic is oversimplified, jing jingoistic nationalisms can easily instrumentalize it to incite a, quote, anti-Chinese populism. This simplification often ignores the complicit role that corrupt African elites play in facilitating resource exploitation. Um, so instead of it, I calling it a colonialism, I call it an extractivism. This is my word that I'm, I'm using um, to describe the dynamic and distinguish it from um, the simultaneously critical of the dynamic, but also uh, distinguish it from previous models of extraction represented by European and Western uh, colonialism and neocolonialism. So the two texts I look at um, in this chapter is one is Kwe Kwarti's Gold of Our Fathers. Uh, it's a detective novel, it takes place in Ghana, it's all about uh, wildcat gold, gold mines um, and this phenomenon on the practice of galamzi, uh, which means to gather and sell. Um, and then the second uh, uh, piece of popular fiction is uh, by Mukuka Chapanta. It's called Casualty of Power. Uh, and this text explores the controversial labor relations in Chinese managed Zambian copper mines. Um, so while I acknowledge the troubling similarities between Chinese investment in natural resources and the Ghanaian and Zambian experience under Western colonialism and neocolonialism, I don't conflate the Chinese presence with these histories because it misses critical differences that alter the texture of the dynamic. This dynamic I said before is called, I call it a Chinese extractivism, um, which combines the Cold War history of Afro-Asian solidarity with new market patterns of multipolar globalization. And I expand this concept of the durees from thinking about the long durée to different key durees, like the extractive durée, the planetary durée, the Afro-pessimistic durée, the revolutionary durée, all of these sequences of events that are kind of um, combined and entangled in the, in the novels um, to, to produce what I call an alluvial matrix of Africa-China relations. Um, chapter three, We've got Figures of Risk, Memoirs of a Chinese South African and a Cameroonian in China. So I shift again uh, countries. Um, so both of these are what I'm calling memoirs of diaspora, uh, from one from a South African of Chinese descent, Ufrida Ho, and a Cameroon student in the PRC, uh, Jean Langkog, uh, Tarif Langkog. Um, both of these memoirs represent the vicissitudes of diasporic mobility in Africa China relations. And they conceptualize mobility through the complex interplay play between racial identity, government bureaucracy, threat of imprisonment, personal risk, and economic gain. This chapter shifts the focus to figures of risk embodied by the gambler and the trickster. As memoirs, these narratives foreground how an individual positions their cultural identity, and here's where the Stuart Hall stuff comes through, complicating and even subverting the official narrative of Africa-China relations through an explicit claim to lived experience. Uh, so by focusing on these autobiographical writings, I expand the concept of alluvial to mean the accretions and erosions of everyday life, whether material or metaphysical, acquired through interactions with others. Um, and I argue that these memoirs exemplify, uh, pulling again from Glissant, cultural creolizations that play or gamble with the alluvium of diasporic experience. So you can see I'm changing genres, poetry in the first chapter, popular fiction in the second chapter, autobiographical writing in the third chapter, memoirs, uh, and the alluvial is taking on different uh, aspects in each of these uh, chapters. So the first text here is Paper Sons and Daughters Growing Up Chinese in Apartheid South Africa by Frida Ho, uh, Chinese South African, and um, focuses on uh, this gambling game Fafi, uh, that some of you may be familiar with um, that's played widely played in, in South Africa, but has its origins in southeastern China. Um, and then the second, uh, the second text is The Black Man and His Visa by Jean Tardif Langkog, which was published in 2013. And it's about how Langkog travels to the PRC 
in the in the mid 2000s during the super cycle period of Chinese investment where all of the sensationalist media headline, headlines were kind of pulling a lot of their material from and he goes to China to, to study traditional Chinese medicine so it's about his um, his uh, challenges of diasporic mobility in the PRC rise of visa restrictions how he masquerades as an African American English teacher for cultural capital purposes um, and I, I talk a lot about uh, if, the, if there's a figure of gambler, that's a figure of risk in um, Frida Ho. It's this trickster figure that's pulled from the uh, Cameroonian uh, grasslands area, the trickster cycles of the tortoise, uh, and how Long Ko pulls from that uh, oral, oral tradition, oral story tradition to hoodwink <laughs> Chinese bureaucracy. So they're both playing, gambling, tricking um, as a way to position their cultural identities within the vicissitudes of mobility. And so I'm calling in that chapter for a kind of hermeneutic or interpretive reorientation of thinking about diaspora outside of, again, the common sort of um, uh, networks of, of diaspora between the West and the rest. Last chapter, chapter four, uh, racialization and Afro-Chinese identity in Henri Lopez's The Lise Le Flamboyant, uh, or The Lily and the Flame Tree. Uh, this chapter argues that race needs to be understood as a complex series of shifting racializations brought about through interactions between Africans and Chinese, rather than as only an engagement with uh, uh, racial ahistoricity as disseminated out of Western classifications rooted in histories of colonialism and imperialism. So I uh, examine how multiracial identity is represented in Henri Lopez's um, The Lily and the Flame Tree, which was published in 1997, um, set primarily during the Cold War, but with flashbacks into the French colonial period. Um, it features the mixed race narrator, Victor Ogagnier Huang. Um, Huang is the child of an indentured Chinese laborer brought by the French to build the Congo Ocean Railway in the 1920s. So we're looking at uh, what is now Congo Brazzaville. And a Congolese woman, Matisse, um, mixed race, black and white, the novel traces Huang's lifelong infatu infatuation with the larger than life Kolele, another mixed race figure who embodies the many shifting facets of post-colonial femininity. Um, so this text really looks at uh, liminality of racial identity, um, thinking about ideology and racial identities. So for example, you know, he, he takes a trip to China, um, as a, a part of a diplomatic corps, um, and really also looks at a lot of how the Congo Brazzavillian history had a lot of Maoism in its conceptualization, especially in the lead up to and under the Marian Guabi regime. So that whatever Maoism's ultimate failures, it looms large um, in the imaginary of Congolese uh, post-colonialism. So the way in which um, the alluvial shifts here, as I call it the racial alluvial, um, and this is uh, a way to get at this idea that um, there's always an inherent creolization of individuals, language, and cultures really to deconstruct the relation, the, the, the centralizing relationship between land and identity. Um, I demonstrate how the novel through Huang's declaration that he quote writes a lecture matisse or a mixed writing. Um, it takes issue with any essentialism, racial, national, revolutionary, religious, or economic. Um, and this is also important for demonstrating how the text resists um, the mystification or the, this jingoistic discourse and how China and, and identities can be instrumentalized um, within these jingoistic discourses around Africa and China. And the conclusion I turn to, so we've got, we've got poetry, we've got, uh, uh, popular fiction, memoir, and then literary novel. Um, and in the conclusion, I talk explicitly about form and aesthetics, and I turn to um, a text that some of you all might be familiar with that was published very recently, Ivan Andiabo's Andiabo Wars, The Dragonfly Sea, which came out in 2019. And I theorize what I call the alluvial form or how a narrative texturizes the matrix of space and time through water and sediment reconfiguring reconfiguring worldliness 
Um, so that's what I end with. Um, and I'll just read the conclusion to my uh, intro here. I'm doing good on time. Um, the book evinces how the symbolic realm rather than exist as only an afterthought um, stands front and center to how Africans and Chinese relate to each other and the worlds they mutually create. Each chapter intervenes into different aspects of the symbolic dimension, the historical, the economic, the diasporic, the racial, and the aesthetic. While each aspect is distinct, they show how they are interrelated through the concept of the alluvial. Unless we understand this new era of globalization as a complex and ever-changing set of relations between human individuals and the planet, rather than only nation states or multinational corporations, we risk reanimating precisely the monstrous mechanism of colonialism that dehumanizes the other to justify and disenfranchisement. These narratives capture the textures of lived experience, the cultural alluvium of Africa-China relations, and so urge us to remain vigilant against any instrumentalization of identity to exploit either another people or the planet itself. Although post-colonialism leveled its, creek at the, uh, its critique at the histories and afterlives of Western imperialism, it is time to update this critique to address the geopolitical, sociocultural, and ecological realities of the 21st century. Um, so just to, to end with a kind of a lead up into you know, conversation Q&A we might have is um, some of the difficult questions that I was working with um, throughout uh, writing the book, um, and some of which you probably got a sense of through the, the, the presentation. Um, but these are kind of the four questions that really I was, I felt like I was constantly coming back to as I was writing it. You know, so the first being how to be critical of the dynamic, but not fall into the rhetoric of yellow peril or the agent as African, which are, you know, that would just reanimate colonial tropes. Two, how to think about race and racialization outside of a binary relationship with whiteness and colonialism. What does that look like? And then three, how to be interdisciplinary in order to speak to the many disciplines. For example, how does the symbolic dimension affect political economy? And then lastly, uh, how, what was the right theoretical concept that emerged out of the interplay between representation and interpretation? So for me, that became the alluvial after many, many, many revisions. So I'll stop there. Um, hopefully that was succinct enough to, um, you know, spur some of the conversation. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to take questions and to talk more about the book. Thank you. I'm going to stop the recording now. Right. What? Should I stop the recording now? Oh, oh yeah. I mean, you can continue the recording. That's fine. Okay. Cool. All right. Oh, there are questions in the chat, so I'll let you. Okay. So Hu says, "I want to propose a question about how China constructs a representation of its presence in Africa for the Chinese audiences, mainland China." Through the cultural discourses, for example, Wolf Warrior II, which tells an imaginary story about a Chinese veteran's actions of saving African people from the local civil war, is China trying to indoctrinate its image as a savior. As I can see that, uh, also, as I can see that many Chinese audiences agree with the officially constructed image of China's presence in Africa is such identity construction propaganda showing the effect in the African context. Um, so I will say I am actually less familiar with the mainland uh, Chinese discourse surrounding Africa-China relations. I talk a bit about, uh, you know, lawn, like that racist laundry detergent advertisement, the, the gala and blackface, um, uh, the Chinese New Year's gala, I believe is in 2017. I can't remember the exact date. Um, and then, you know, Wolf Warrior as kind of this generalized depiction of, of a kind of a nameless African space. Um, I will say, though, that um, an interesting aspect to get at your first question is, is how um, the Cold War relationships inform the contemporary dynamics. So I talk about something called an elder comrade mentality where you know, since the PRC had founded itself in 1949 and then was kind of um, involved in, in different uh, Maoist leaning movements, uh, often in terms of liberation struggle on the African continent, there is this kind of sense of, oh, we started on this Marxist teleology first, 
So here's kind of you know how you go about uh, you know constructing a socialist state after uh, you know Western imperialism. So there's that that kind of elder comrade mentality then seeps into some of the post Cold War discourse surrounding you know reform economic reforms. For example, um, you know the PRC is now outsourcing. This is coming from um, Deborah Braudigam's text. Um, among others, but as outsourcing a lot of mature industries like pharmaceuticals, leather making, um, stuff that isn't profitable anymore because of overcapacity um, and labor, um, increasing costs of labor in China to different African states so they, so they can move up the, the value chain. So you have also, so not only do you have this kind of ideological elder comrade thing, and now that's being kind of reconceptualized under, you know, post market reforms, thinking about how something like the special economic zones function um, in different African states. I mean, I think there's something, at least 13, if not more at this point, um, definitely more uh, scattered across. So they're exporting the special economic zone as a, as a model of development as well. Um, and then your second question, hopefully that gives you a sense of what, where I'm, what I'm thinking about for the first question. The second question is, um, you know, this is interesting. I think what popped into my head when you, when you, when you, the, the second question and how it, the Chinese representation is being interpreted in the, in the African context, um, you know, Awur is a really interesting figure for this because um, I remember she's, she just did a, uh, a expose interview where they were actually in um, Kenya near Pate. Um, and the kind of archipelago that she, the Lamu archipelago that she writes the novel from, because it's very much based on the Indian Ocean. And that was, uh, what was it, she, CGN TV or whatever the, whatever the Chinese, one of those Chinese state media channels. Uh, she did that on that, on that channel. Um, and she's given quotes and interviews, you know, talking about how a lot of the Africa China discourse is kind of the sensationalism and the, the panic writing about a new colonialism is often coming from non, um, non-African sources is what she, she writes about. And I, I, I pick up on that in my conclusion. So I think it's interesting, she's an interesting figure because she's trying to kind of cut in between um, the, uh, the, the political discourses uh, and kind of move in and out of, 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 you know, try to move in between the, the how these different state entities are trying to, um, you know, interpret her, her work. So I think that's an interesting, an interesting point. Um, okay, so does that help you? Okay, great. And thank you, Tom. Great. Um, I also love the concept of the museum. And then Stephanie, you, you ask, uh, you brought up a lot of terms and concepts. Can you share a list of these? Sure. Um, let's see here. So, I mean, the main concept is the alluvial. Um, and so the first chapter is like the alluvium of history. So thinking about history as layers and overlapped and, and not only that, but also thinking about art as a way to animate that relationship between history and figures and art. Um, this kind of liminal space uh, between the shore, you know, like, like so. So within it, the Awe tradition of the of the Kino Cantor, they actually perform their uh, they actually perf they're actually traditionally performing on the shore. Um, at like the space itself between land and water, and so there's a kind of uh, you know a a a way to. Um, interpret what's being washed up onto the shore um, from the ocean. And so a winner really leans into that um, in the first chapter. The second chapter um, is about like actual mineral alluvium. Um, what, I mean, I guess maybe, you know, what are some of the, what are some of the terms that you heard that you want a little bit more gloss on? I'll, I'll I'll go I'll go on to Thomas's question. Thanks for your question, Thomas. Um, so 
one of the arguments in the second chapter is that the 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 spatial and temporal matrix is different. So it's it's as basic as this historical differences, right? Um, there's still natural resource extracting going on. There's still um, you know issues of corruption and complicitly complicity with um, local elites. But at the same time, you have this history of third worldism at play, and how that's um, you know configured and reconfigured within the contemporary moment. You also have um, things like um, the internet and the digital world, um, which provide a different kind of interaction and space for interaction. So that's different than previous um, configurations. You also have um, the fact that. Um, the uh, losing my train of thought. Um, the contem oh yeah, the contemporary, um, uh, the contemporary moment is the first time wherein this idea of resource extraction actually there's finite limits now, like the you know climate crisis. Um, you know, in 20 years after some of these leases are up or, you know, the, the resource for infrastructure loans are repaid, um, there may not actually be enough natural resources left over. So we're actually reaching a kind of finite limit, planetarily speaking, that is completely different than, than, than the previous um, colonial, neocolonial moment, which treated resources as basically infinite. Um, and then you also have, um, uh, just the the fact that these African elites have multiple um, multiple uh, geopolitical entities to play off of each other. So it's kind of similar to the Cold War, where they would play like Julius Nyerere in Tanzania was a really good example of this. Would play the the the, cold, the socialist bloc against the capitalist bloc. Um, here you also have this uh, situation wherein um, a lot of these uh, a lot of these elites will are able to play the, the quote unquote global market um, for different investment um, opportunities and infrastructure. And so what happens is that the PRC often has the best terms for uh, agreements to build infrastructure. Um, and there's also stuff about how, you know, um, even though this is from an article, I'm forgetting the, the scholar's name, um, in terms of like actual mineral extraction control that China has across um, the continent, something like 6.7%, um, like majority control of a particular, um, you know, uh, mine or, or, or mineral. Um, and that's like less, that's like less than half than one um, major multinational conglomerate uh, 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 Anglo-American, which is like like 14.7-15% of overall control. So there is definitely the only, I think, um, resource mineral-wise that's actually in majority control by PRC affiliated companies is bauxite in, in the Congo for aluminum, I believe, or batteries. Well, I think bauxites. No, it's cobalt for batteries, bauxites for aluminum. So maybe it's cobalt. Um, but other than that, it's it's actually nowhere near um, as close as as these other, um, you know, other uh, other entities. So there's lots of you can get into the weeds with with the different trade statistics. There's just really like the Chinese can't act with the kind of simply put, the Chinese can't act with the kind of impunity that that these multinationals um, and previously during like straight up colonialism. Um, acted with across the, the continent. Um, a lot of these deals are, um, you know, they're negotiated. So it's, there's always a kind of, there's a whole system of, of, uh, of agreements and negotiations that, that go into place. Of course, those, you know, are subject to corruption and all that kind of stuff, but um, it's, a, it's a, the process is a little bit more complex than, than the Chinese are sh showing up and, and uh, you know, staking a claim over something. Um, okay, so Stephanie says, I have uh, one, okay, creolization Matisse. Okay, yeah, so 
So basically, I'm interested in um, thinking about Glissant's uh, concept of creolization as a way to pull apart the essentializing relationship between land and identity that you see often in resource nationalisms, for example, um, in Zambia and Ghana. So, um, you know, the thing that happens here is that, for example, the Chinese interest in resources um, will trigger um, the colonial trauma of emasculation and extraction. So then you have a lot of anti-populist or anti-Chinese um, discourses that emerge as a way to foment electoral support, like you saw, like you see in Michael Sata's case um, when he came to power in Zambia. Um, but then immediately after he came to power, he kind of saddled up to the, to the PRC and you know made sure the relations were were running. Um, so the creolization is thinking about it both culturally, like how how culturally we are constantly um, exchanging and constantly um, our lived experiences are actually a combination of interactions and ex constant exchanges with other peoples and places. Um, and so there's an entanglement that happens there um, and a demystification of just saying, oh, I am, I am, I am this and I am from here. It's kind of like how, you know, racial categories become naturalized, right? Um, when really they're constantly being configured and reconfigured and racialization is a, is a process that takes into account many different variables. Similar thing there, I'm just, I'm just theorizing it through creolization into, into just cultural identity itself. Um, and that, and it's really useful to think about diaspora and race in that con in that context. So, you know, what does it mean for there to be, you know, Chinese South Africans, or what does it mean for um, there to be, um, you know, uh, uh, Cameroonians studying in, in in China and learning, you know, traditional Chinese medicine, or I mean, move into the racial aspect. What does it mean to have multiracial people that are that have you know both African and Chinese ancestry um, you know where do they these sorts of uh, individuals um, kind of defamiliarize racial categories and demonstrate the arbitrariness of, of the naturalization of these categories but again it's what's really interesting for me is that it's de-emphasizing the relationship with the West and whiteness and colonialism. So that always seems to have been the primary uh, point of comparison for a lot of how we think about post-colonial identity, but now we have different worlds. Um, and actually one of my arguments is that we've always had these kinds of worlds, but they've just been kind of de-emphasized or effaced um, by the, the, the dominance of that, of that relationship between colonizer and colonizer. Does that make sense? I have another question, but I'm I'm not sure how to I'm not sure to say words and see if you understand what I'm getting at. Um, so you you did a, an interesting job, sort of looking at different regions of the continent through literature, and I'm curious to hear how you think about or how you think of Africa as this monolith. From the other perspective, I don't know. Does that make any sense? Like, can you say it again? No, let me try again. <laughs> um, I mean, considering that the continent of Africa is vast and there are lots of different cultures and different, um, yeah, yeah, different types of people all over. I'm thinking about it's just to like play on your, the way that you're thinking about like, what does it mean to be like a, a Chinese South African or so on? Um, I'm thinking about how the African is configured in the Chinese imaginary and how that, fig how that filters back to how the African, how the, how this filters back into the, in African literature, the, the representation of Africa as a monolith. Yeah, um, you know, there's interesting exchanges in some of the, this usually happens around language when there's, when the topic of language comes up in some of the novels um, where, you know, like for example, in the detective novel, um, 
there are multiple Chinese characters, but they're not all um, speaking Mandarin. Some speak Cantonese, others are speaking their own dialects. And so when the, the hero detective is trying to solve the case, this murder case, he's, he's like asks one uh, shop owner's Chinese to speak to another Chinese person. And he's like, well, well, no, we don't speak the same Chinese. He speaks Cantonese, I speak Mandarin or vice versa. Um, and there's this moment where like, like the, the, the detective's like, oh, really? There are multiple, you know, languages? And, and then the, the, the Chinese man in the novel said, well, it's just like in Ghana, there are multiple <laughs> languages and multiple ethnicities. So I think, you know, and you see this again in, in Le Lise and the Flamboyant where a uh, question of language um, comes up repeatedly. Um, there's this really amazing scene where it's um, the, uh, so Huang's father, who was the indentured laborer that was brought over to, to, to build the railway, um, and who stays on and marries a mixed race Congolese woman, um, has this flashback, uh, or it's during a flashback and it's another exchange with another, and they're both speaking Cantonese. And they like live together because there's other people that speak Mandarin, but they're like, oh, we want to be able to speak Cantonese together. So there's like a, a heterogeneity of and interactions there. But he's talking about how he's having these dreams of how um, you know he still dreams in Chinese, but all of the people in the dream in the dreams are Congolese. So everyone's speaking perfect Cantonese, but they're of Congolese extraction. So the kind of um, defamiliarization of race and, and appearance um, and language, I think, is is an important um, an important uh, point that a lot of the texts are making that are resisting a kind of a, a kind of homogenization that you see in something like uh, Wolf Warrior Two. Any other questions? <laughs> well, if there's no more questions, then you know I think we can we can probably wrap up, right? I mean, Yes. Anybody has anything pressing? No, this was really great. Thank you so much for for all of it. Um, there's a few sort of housekeeping things, um, sure. if if possible. Um, would you be able to send us a list of references? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Circulate with the, um, to the group. Sure. Yeah, for our project. Yeah, you know, and that's actually something I, I that's really great that that y'all are doing because it's something I was thinking about when I was when I was writing was, was, you know, the politics of citation and, and who, which is why, you know, like my main, my main theorist is Guisant, you know, I wanted somebody already working, already doing the kind of, the, the, the shift away had already, away from the West is that it was already done by him and I can kind of pick up from, from that Caribbean context and, and think about it in this, in the more Indian Ocean framework. So yeah, I can, I can definitely send, um, a bibliography of the, of the yeah. book. That would be great. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was how, if I did have another question, it would be about, so the terms that were standing out to me were very much like things that I understand from a Caribbean context. And it was really interesting to me that you are applying these things to this particular side. I don't know, as you know, I'm more like West African <laughs> centered. I don't know anything about the other side. Mm -hmm. So focusing on the other side was really interesting to me, but I was really curious to hear, maybe it's, I couldn't hear it because I didn't know them, they were not familiar, um, and so they, they didn't stay, but like the, the concepts that are coming from that region of the world and how they could circle back, <laughs> if that makes sense, geographically. Like, you mean, like, say, say it again. Which terms did you come across oh, okay. that region of the world? Like, what's happening in Tanzania? <laughs> um, so one of, the, one of the words that was really helpful for me um, in the first chapter, I was thinking about a way epistemology is this uh, term, uh, I think it's, I'm going to mispronounce it. It's like sisisalame, sisisalame, sisisalame. Um, but it means to think, think at feeling inside. And so it's this, 
it's this approach or worldview that resists the Cartesian split between the mind and body and sees instead as these, you know, your, you, how you think about things is intimately connected to your bodily state and, and your senses and your, your materiality. And so that kind of, uh, that kind of approach was really helpful um, for thinking about the representations in the poetry and how, you know, this idea that consciousness, artistic representation, artistic intervention can actually, you know, impact how, and it's in its synthesis of history can actually impact how history um, comes about. It can be both a vehicle and catalyst for history, um, which is something that comes out of that, that worldview very explicitly. That's the point of think, thinking and feeling inside is to, is to um, serve as that conduit. Um, which is again that liminal space between uh, the, the 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 land and water. Another really important thing was the uh, uh, the trickster cycles of of the grasslands in Cameroon, um, and how you know these oral stories, these oral sagas, are 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 reconfigured in Langkok's text according to his. Um, challenges that he faces in um, in the PRC. So he does all of these moves to trick or play with the with the bureaucracy to hoodwink them. For example, like and they're they're kind of inspired. If you go and you read the trickster cycle of the tortoise and everything, and they're kind of like this. His tricks that he plays on the Chinese bureaucracy are derived from from the tricks that the tortoise plays on, like the lion or the uh, I think like the 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 boar there's a there's a few different ones but one one for example is like making somebody search for something that isn't there <laughs> and so like for example um yeah long code has this whole episode about how he, he gets picked up by the police dragnet and he's sitting in the because they're gonna they're trying to because he's you know he's he's, he's uh, stayed past his visa and they're trying to find him in the system and he just keeps giving them false passport numbers. <laughs> and so they just keep looking for something that isn't there until they get tired of it and let him go. So, and that's directly inspired from, you know, that one of the, the, the stories of the tortoise and, and, uh, and the Anglophone trickster cycle. So for me, it was really interesting to, to again, it's kind of like hermeneutic or interpretive reorientation and anchoring, um, anchoring the, uh, the analysis and um, these these worldviews and language and cultural formations that are from various African contexts. Does that help? Yeah, it definitely does. Thank you so much. Or I should say Dr. Yu. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. This is this is the first time I've kind of given a, a bit of a spiel on, on the book. Um, so it's, it's good, uh, good to get some of it out. No, well, well, anytime you want to come back, we will take more. <laughs> and do you think you can share your slides? It, it's okay if you can. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're just the, uh, the, just the chapter, the, 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 head, the headings from the, from the introduction. So. Yeah, that would be great. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you everyone for coming. Appreciate it. <laughs> And we'll circulate this around the graduate school. Okay, great. I will stop the recording.